Hi guys, in today's video we're going to take a look at what is electronegativity, how do we measure electronegativity, trends in electronegativity, looking at why we see these trends, polar bonds, dipole moments, the spectrum of bonds, polar molecules, an exam style question, and finally a summary. So first it's important that we have a look at what is electronegativity. Well first, let's recap our understanding of a covalent bond. We know a covalent bond involves a shared pair of electrons. And we know that a covalent bond is a strong electrostatic attraction between a shared pair of electrons and the nuclei of the bonded atoms. And you can see two chlorine atoms here with this covalent bond here. Now electronegativity is a measure of the attraction of a bonded atom for the pair of electrons in the covalent bond. So now we know what electronegativity is, how do we measure it? Well, it's measured using something called the Pauling scale. The scale was invented by a chemist called Linus Pauling, an incredibly important and interesting chemist. And you can see here, we have what looks like the periodic table with values on it. And these values are our values of electronegativity. So now we've had a look at what electronegativity is and how we measure it. Let's have a look at the trends that we see in electronegativity. Well in general electronegativity increases across a period and up a group. Essentially it's increasing in all directions towards fluorine. But why do we see these trends? As we said, electronegativity increases across a period. Now this is because the charge on the nucleus increases across a period. What's happening is, as we move across the period, the number of protons in the nucleus increases. And therefore, there's an increased attraction for the outer electrons. The bonding pair of electrons and the outer electrons are attracted more strongly. So moving from lithium to fluorine, we see an increase in electronegativity as we're attracting those outer electrons more strongly. Now up our group, we see an increase in electronegativity. Now that's because down the group, the bonding pair of electrons is held increasingly further away from the nucleus. This is because the number of shells increases, the number of electron shells and the distance of the outer electrons from the nucleus therefore increases too. The bonding pair of electrons are therefore attracted less strongly. So moving down the group from fluorine to bromine, you can see that our bromine atom has so many more electron shells and the bonding pair of electrons will be held out here, much further away from the nucleus than in fluorine when they're held over here. Now these trends are incorporated into what we call periodicity. If you haven't met it yet, don't worry, we'll take a closer look at it a little bit later in this course. These polar bonds occur when one atom in a bond is more electronegative than another. Here we have a bond between hydrogen and chlorine, and you can see we have the electronegativity values from Pauling's scale here. Chlorine has a value of 3.0, whereas hydrogen has a value of 2.1. And you can see that means that chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. Therefore, the chlorine has a greater attraction for the electrons in the bond than hydrogen does. And the electrons are held closer to the chlorine than the hydrogen. So if you want a visual representation, it would look something like this. You can see that shared pair of electrons is held closer to the chlorine as it's more electronegative than to the hydrogen. This results in what we call a dipole. So the differing attraction for the pair of electrons allows there to be a small charge difference between the atoms. You can see that the electrons, as we said, are held more close to our chlorine atom. This makes our chlorine atom slightly negative. Delta means slightly. And our hydrogen atom will therefore be slightly positive. Now these dipoles are what we call a permanent dipole. This slight charge difference is always present. So let's take a look at polar and nonpolar bonds. Nonpolar bonds occur if the two bonding atoms are identical. Their attraction for the shared pair of electrons is equal, and that's because they all have equal values of electronegativity. The electrons are equally distributed between the bonding atoms, and you'll see that the bond is perfectly covalent. In a polar bond, if the two atoms are different, their attraction for the shared pair of electrons is unequal. We saw the bond between hydrogen and chlorine before, and we saw how the chlorine was more electronegative and it had a greater attraction for the shared pair of electrons. 
the bonding atom with the greater attraction for the shared pair of electrons is the one that's more electronegative. In this situation, our chlorine, and we see the bond is polarised. Another way to visually represent this is to have a look at the electron density. The electron density relates to the probability of finding electrons at a particular position in space. It can be imagined as a cloud of electrons around our nucleus. If we have a look at our two hydrogen atoms that are covalently bonded together, we said this molecule was non-polar. There's no difference in our electronegativities of our two atoms. And you can see that the electron density, which looks a bit like contour lines, and you can actually imagine it like contour lines, the more lines and the more close together, the more electron dense the area is. Well, we can see it's completely symmetrical and completely equal. Whereas if we have a look at our hydrogen chloride molecule, you can see that there's much greater area of electron density around our chlorine atom, reflecting the fact that it's much more electronegative. So this actually allows for what we call a spectrum of bonds. Rather than bonds existing as discretely ionic and covalent, they exist on a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, we have our ionic bonding, where the difference in electronegativity is so great that one atom effectively takes the electron from the other. At the other end, we have our covalent bonding. There's no difference in electronegativity, and the molecule is electronically symmetrical. In the middle, we have our polar covalent bonding, where the difference in electronegativity is quite small. The atoms share the electrons unequally, and the bond is what we call polarised. And understanding the spectrum is quite important. So now I've had a look at electronegativity and polar bonds, let's take a look at the difference between polar and non-polar molecules. Well, molecules containing polar bonds are not always polar. The symmetry of polar bonds within our molecule can cancel out the effect of any permanent dipole. If we take a look first at a molecule that is non-symmetrical, so a difference in charge exists across the molecule. We have an overall dipole, an overall slight difference in charge, and the molecule is polar. Here we have a molecule of water. As you can see, water has two lone pairs and two bonding pairs of electrons. And the shape that it takes, as you may already know, is a non-linear shape with a bond angle of 104.5 degrees you can see that it's non-symmetrical. And what we mean by that is the dipoles resulting from the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen cannot cancel each other out. Whereas in our symmetrical molecule, the symmetry of the molecule means that the effect of any permanent dipole is cancelled out. Linear, trigonal planar, or tetrahedral shapes are all symmetrical in the case that all atoms attached to the central atom are identical. So no difference in charge exists across our symmetrical molecules, and the molecule itself is nonpolar, despite containing polar bonds. So an example of that is carbon dioxide. The bonds between the carbon and the oxygen are themselves polar, but the molecule takes a linear shape. And as you can see, these two bonds here and here are symmetrical, and as a result, the effect of any permanent dipole will be cancelled out. So let's quickly summarise what are polar and nonpolar bonds. Well, a nonpolar bond is when the two bonding atoms are identical and the electrons are equally distributed between the bonding atoms. You can see here we have two hydrogens covalently bonded to each other. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1. Now, because the electronegativity values are the same, we have a nonpolar bond. The electrons are equally distributed. In a polar bond, the two bonding atoms are different, and their attraction for the shared pair of electrons is unequal. Here we have hydrogen and chlorine, where hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1 and chlorine 3.0. As chlorine is more electronegative, the electrons are attracted to the chlorine atom and are held closer to our chlorine atom. Now, let's quickly summarise the difference between polar and non-polar molecules. In our polar molecules, a difference in charge exists across the molecule. There's an overall permanent dipole. Our example is water. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1 and oxygen 3.5. And you can see here that as our molecule is not symmetrical, the permanent dipoles are not cancelled out overall and a permanent overall dipole exists.
In our non-polar molecules, the symmetry of the molecule means the effect of any permanent dipoles is cancelled out, and there is no difference in charge that exists across the molecule. We have carbon dioxide, and we can see it has a symmetrical linear shape. And although the individual bonds are polar, Overall, the effect of any permanent dipoles is cancelled out and there is no difference in charge, so it's a non-polar molecule. Which of the following molecules is polar? And we're given four. Silicon tetrachloride, carbon dioxide, ammonia and boron trifluoride. Now we know in order for a molecule to be polar, there has to be a difference of electronegativity and a difference in charge. Now we also know that molecules are non-polar if they're symmetrical. So we can go through and eliminate the answers that are symmetrical. We know silicon tetrachloride will have a central silicone surrounded by four chlorine atoms. And it has a structure a bit like methane, a tetrahedral structure, meaning it's symmetrical and therefore it cannot be polar. Our carbon dioxide we know has a linear shape and we know that that is indeed non-polar. Our ammonia. Now our ammonia does not have a symmetrical shape. We know that ammonia will take a pyramidal shape, so that could be our answer. But first let's have a look at our fourth option, boron trifluoride. Well we know that boron trifluoride takes a trigonal planar shape and we know that that is symmetrical and that will be non-polar as well. So our answer is C, ammonia. Let's have a look at the second part of the question. In magnesium iodide, some polarisation of the bond occurs. Explain, in terms of magnesium iodide, what the term polarisation means. Here we're asked to explain the term polarisation, and we're asked to do it in terms of magnesium iodide, so we must make reference to magnesium iodide in our answer. This question holds three marks, so how are we going to answer it? Well, the answer is that there is a small difference in electronegativity between the magnesium and the iodine. And as a result, the pair of electrons are shared unequally. And there is an uneven distribution of charge, and therefore the bond is polarised. Here we refer to both magnesium and iodine in our answer. We've explained that the bond is polarised because there's a small difference in electronegativity between the magnesium and iodine. As a result, the electrons are shared unequally, and this results in an uneven distribution of charge. So let's take a look at question 3. Both NF3, nitrogen trifluoride, and BF3, boron trifluoride molecules, contain polar bonds. However, only one of these molecules is polar. State which molecule is polar and explain this difference. So here we're being asked to compare NF3 nitrogen trifluoride and BF3 boron trifluoride. We're told they contain polar bonds. However, only one is polar. Now, you should know that it's the difference in shapes that makes one of these molecules polar. It's in fact NF3 that's polar. NF3 nitrogen trifluoride has a pyramidal shape, a trigonal pyramidal shape. It's not a symmetrical shape, so the dipoles don't cancel. However, boron trifluoride has a symmetrical trigonal planar shape. The symmetrical shape means the dipoles do indeed cancel out, meaning boron trifluoride is not polar. I've explained that nitrogen trifluoride is polar as it has a pyramidal shape and is not symmetrical, meaning that the dipoles do not cancel. Boron trifluoride is not overall polar, it has a trigonal planar shape and is symmetrical, so the dipoles do cancel. There are three marks in this question. The first for identifying that it is indeed NF3 that is polar, the second for explaining why, and the third for explaining that it's boron trifluoride that's not polar and explaining why. Moving on to question four. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon and hydrogen, which have roughly equal electronegativities. Define the term electronegativity. The definition of electronegativity is something you should know off the top of your head. You should know that it's the ability of an atom to attract electrons in a covalent bond. And for this definition, we receive two marks. Definitions are an easy and quick way for you to gain marks, so it's important that you know them inside out. Moving on to part B. Carbon, hydrogen and chlorine can form the molecule dichloromethane, CH2Cl2. Draw a 3D diagram of CH2Cl2 dichloromethane and indicate the polar bonds using partial charges. Well, using our knowledge of bonding, we know that dichloromethane will take a tetrahedral shape. And remember we're being asked to draw a 3D diagram using our wedges, it will look something like this. 
remembering to use dipoles to show the partial charges and our wedges to show that the different atoms are in different planes. So we get one mark for our correct 3D structure of dichloromethane and one mark for our correct dipoles to show the partial charges. In part C, we're asked to show why CHCl2 dichloromethane is a polar molecule. Well, you can see that the molecule isn't symmetrical and therefore the dipoles don't cancel out. And that's exactly what we need to say. That simple explanation will get us the one mark that we need. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap of my smiley face and together let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.